figure it out together. Just Asking with Saroja Coelho. Live Saturday afternoon at 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific, and on CBC Listen. You know the feeling of finding a really good podcast or the feeling of someone always being there, like your favorite radio show. Stream CBC Podcasts, CBC Music, and CBC Radio anytime, anywhere. Download the CBC Listen app for free. This is CBC News. At 12 o'clock, we're at minus 10 degrees with partly cloudy skies over downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Humphrey. A first-year University of Winnipeg student says he's concerned about what the university's cyber incident means for his exams and personal information. The university says the incident was discovered on Sunday. Classes were canceled Monday. And John Paul Mirabel says a number of the services he normally uses are offline. It's been really difficult to access our notes. Uh, I know for my classes, I haven't been able to, you know, access that because everything is in our Nexus page. It's really, really difficult. Uh, and especially at this time, it's near the end of the year. The university says it's looking into what happened and working to restore services. A virtual town hall is planned for four o'clock this afternoon to give an update on the situation. Community leaders in Winnipeg are pressuring the province to give them more control over the development of their neighborhoods. They want a significant increase in funding for Indigenous centres, women's centres and neighbourhood groups. Michelle Wickerink is with the Spence Neighbourhood Association. Her group helps dozens of young people get good jobs each year. And Wickerink says the association offers ongoing support so they stay employed. But... She says they don't have enough funding to help everyone willing to work. After 20 years in existence, the success of this program has been proven time and time again. It is life changing and yet the only funding we've been able to secure for the upcoming year is through our NRC grant and some short term funding from foundations. The group wants the province to be an investor while the communities lead and plan. A work in progress. That's the central message of the RCMP's official response to the public inquiry into the Nova Scotia 2020 mass shooting. Brett Ruskin explains. It's been one year since the Mass Casualty Commission's final report. The result was 130 recommendations designed to address factors that led to the Nova Scotia shooting in April of 2020. 75 of them were directed at police. Today, we heard from the RCMP that they've taken that list and are looking at the principle of each recommendation. The RCMP has created 10 different themes, new categories, and three different phases. Digging into what's actually been done so far, police say they've completed 10 of the 130 recommendations, and the big ones still haven't been addressed, like a full overhaul of the organizational structure and a deadline to phase out the Regina, Saskatchewan training depot by 2032. Police today addressed that point by saying they're improving depot with no phase out on the horizon. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Millbrook, Nova Scotia. Mounties say they've seized a large quantity of cocaine, firearms and cash after searching several homes in Fairford, Manitoba. Last Friday, officers from a number of RCMP units, including D Division, the Drone Unit and the Organized Crime Unit, searched five separate homes in the community. Officers seized 2.5 kilos of cocaine, firearms and 25,000 in cash. Two men and one woman faced numerous firearms and trafficking charges. All six construction workers missing after yesterday's Baltimore Bridge collapse are now presumed dead. And as the search continues this morning for their bodies, plans are being made for the eventual removal of both the remains of the bridge and the cargo ship that brought it down. Chris Reyes has your details. Seeing this wreckage in person, you get a sense of how much work it will take to clear what is now blocking the shipping lane that leads into the port of Baltimore. Let's start with what you can see on the surface, the massive steel arch of the bridge sitting on top of the cargo ship, just stranded there in the middle of the river. Getting that out of the way will take a lot of specialized equipment that will have to come into the area from other parts of the country. Remember, this is an 86,000 ton ship. This was a two and a half kilometer steel bridge. That's a lot of weight, 
a lot of wreckage to clear. As we heard from the Coast Guard, there's a lot of steel now in that river that will also have to be recovered. That said, President Biden said he will move heaven and earth to get this bridge repaired and that port open again. As we speak, there are dozens of vessels stuck inside the port and then more vessels that are scheduled to come into the port in the coming days. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Baltimore. In Winnipeg, St. Mary's Road at Furmore had to be closed overnight because of a fire in a business. Fire crews were called to the single-story building in the 700 block around 2 a.m. They found heavy smoke and flames coming from the building. No one was inside. No one was hurt. The cause of the fire is under investigation. And the Winnipeg Humane Society wants people to bring in their lethal animal traps for the chance to win a gift card. The Trade in Your Trap campaign launches today. It says in the past several months it had two cases where pets have been the unintended victims of such traps. One cat was brought in with severe injuries after getting caught in an illegal trap in, in Winnipeg. The CEO says the traps don't discriminate. She says many animals get caught in traps that have long been forgotten about. The traps being accepted include body grip coney bear traps, which are illegal in Winnipeg. People who bring in traps will be entered to win a $200 gift card. In Winnipeg, clearing throughout the day and windy today, a high of minus 6 in the Wheat City, mainly sunny and windy, and a high of minus 6 degrees. Right now, you're listening to CBC Radio 1. Welcome to Radio Noon for Wednesday, March 27th. It's going to be minus 6 degrees today, and it's going to stay windy. Riley will be in to tell us more about that in a while. Coming up on the show today, the Winnipeg Humane Society, as you've just heard Matt talking about, hopes to snare some attention with their Trade in Your Trap campaign. It's aimed at saving animals' lives. That's after the 12.30 news. And coming up, we'll take you to the Royal Manitoba Winter Fair in Brandon and hear why one woman drove all the way from Calgary to attend and why she brought her horse along. But first up, a member of the St. Boniface Street Links team died of a drug overdose on the weekend. We'll hear from Street Links founder Marion Willis at 12.05. For Marion Willis, the high number of people dying from drug overdoses is horrifying. Willis is the founder of St. Boniface Street Links, offering supportive housing to people transitioning out of homelessness. The province's latest preliminary data shows 445 people died in 2023, and it's on track to set a new record. Willis says someone on her Street Links team died of an overdose over the weekend. She wants governments and frontline workers to come together to make a comprehensive plan. She spoke with the CBC's Rosanna Hempel. Well, certainly it's not surprising to me. It saddens me deeply. Um, to be honest, I'm horrified that we're this many years into a drug crisis, and I don't know how much higher, how many more records we need to hit before we can agree that this is a drug crisis. Um, we can call it a toxic drug crisis. We can give it whatever label we want to give it. But this is a drug crisis, and it's taking, it's costing a lot of lives. You know, and uh, nothing is going to change until governments at all levels come together with our sector emergency services that we can all get around a table together and begin to de develop a comprehensive strategy that reflects the diversity of drug users. Uh, they're not all the same. It's not uh, just one demographical uh, population of drug users. And we need a multifaceted plan. You know, we tend to be uh, always very reactive. You know, somebody dies, the stats come out. There's a call for, you know, uh, to hurry up and get together, you know, uh, safe consumption sites and to offer safe supply. I think you'll find that uh, very many of the people who are dying from drug overdoses are dying in their homes. They're dying in other people's homes. They're not dying on the streets. Some are, but that's not the entire drug using population and don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not saying that safer supply and uh, you know safe consumption sites 
aren't the answer, but they are one very small component of what should be a much larger harm reduction strategy, you know, that really, you know, is the product of a plan. And so what are those bigger issues that we need to tackle in order to reduce these numbers? Well, you know, I think that we need to, um, today we're talking about, you know, the, the numbers that are out from the Chief Medical Examiner's Office. So through that single lens now we'll talk about addiction. And what we seem not to do is to recognize that, you know, right across every department of government, you know, justice and families and housing and addictions and mental health and so on and so on. You know, the municipal government, um, the uh, emergency um, emergency services and our nonprofit sector, we all need to gather around to recognize that, you know, the, the homelessness, the housing crisis, drug addiction, mental health, the crime in the city, all of these issues are becoming deeply rooted, almost normalized, which is kind of scary, right? And they're all interrelated and interconnected. And we need a single plan that addresses you know, uh, all of that, right? And and it needs to be properly resourced. And, and I think that if there was truly across every department of government approach to this, then the plan wouldn't even be that expensive because the cost would be shared across all of those government departments. There's a role for everybody to play. There's a role for the federal government. We need a national drug strategy. Manitoba is not the only province in Canada with record stats. It's right across this country, you know. So we need a new national drug strategy. So there's the federal role, you know. And then the provinces and the municipal governments need to come together. Emergency services and everybody needs to get around the same t around the same table at the same time and we need to get the conversation going and out of that conversation needs to be a strategy built around the pillars you know of prevention and and uh, harm reduction and uh, you know and uh, what and looking what intervention really looks like and you know the police um, RCMP and uh, city police have done a fantastic job really on the diversion and suppression side of things. So those two pillars the police have developed quite well, uh, but there's all the rest of it and there, there's, there's no plan. And I think since 2016, you know, I, I feel like I'm talking, um, I don't know who I'm talking to, deaf people, they're not listening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. Um, this isn't going to get better on its own. Marion Willis is with St. Boniface Street Links. She spoke with the CBC's Rosanna Hempel. Manitoba's Minister of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness says she's working on making drug testing machines available to communities. Bernadette Smith also says she'll have more on a supervised consumption site after the provincial budget comes out next week. Your local news at your fingertips. CBC News has a local news app made for your phone or tablet. So don't waste time scrolling for the local stories you want. Just download the app to get the information that matters to you, when it happens, and how you want it. Another way to get your local news. The CBC News app. Download it today. And you are listening to Radio Noon. It's 13 minutes after 12 o'clock. I'm Laurie Hoogstratton. Well, it was one of those days in weather today where it's, yeah, it's spring. And what was with all the snow and ice and blowing around? And one of those, the winds are strong enough to like grab the door handle right out of your hand. I'll tell you a bit more about Riley's forecast in a minute. But just to let you know, uh, lethal animal traps are deadly and they're against the law in Winnipeg. The Humane Society has a campaign to collect them and protect wildlife and pets. And we'll talk about that just after the news at 12.35. And the Royal Manitoba Winter Fair in Brandon's well underway, and we'll hear why one woman and her horse made the trip from Calgary to take part. I wonder if she rode the horse, maybe got its own seat on the airplane. But anyway, they came all the way from Calgary to the Manitoba Winter Fair, which is a tradition with many Manitobans. Taking a look at Riley's forecast for today, clearing this afternoon. Can't quite see through the curtains, but maybe it's clearing now. 
Uh, highs of minus 6 down to minus 12 tonight. Sunny on Thursday and 1 degree. We're getting above zero. Yay. Thursday night, minus 8. Friday, 3. Saturday, 2 degrees. Sunday, 3 degrees. Some temperatures. Brandon, minus 10. Churchill, minus 14. Dauphin, minus 11. Gimli, minus 10. The Paw, minus 13. And Thompson, it's minus 11. And in Winnipeg right now, it's minus 10 with winds out of the north, northwest at 34. It's been a spring break tradition for over a century. The 114th Royal Manitoba Winter Fair is well underway in Brandon. Alex Armstrong and her horse drove from Calgary to compete in the horse show. She spoke with the CBC's Chelsea Kemp. Uh, It's my first time horse showing here. Um, My trainer recommended it a lot. You know, I love doing the jumpers and I'm trying to get some more exposure for her as well. Although this, this is her home ground from when I first bought her. What's it like getting ready for a trip like this? It's stressful. It's very, very stressful because uh, you know you got to pack your own suitcase, you got to pack your horse's suitcase, um, you got to make sure they're in condition, you got to make sure everything's ready for her, um, and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. How much do you think you'll spend on a trip like this? Uh, probably in the thousands. Like I probably this trip's probably going to cost me about one point two, one point three. When, then that's like a, a, uh, like a thousand two hundred, right? Or is that twelve? Yeah, yeah, yeah like twelve hundred dollars. So. Yeah. Are you riding every night you're here? Yeah, I am. Yeah, it's usually about a class a day. Um, if you're doing like the tens and the fifteens, then it's two classes. If you're doing the night class, then you just come and lunge, uh, lunge your horse sometime in the afternoon, and then you do your night class. Yeah. What, what drives you to like make the twelve hour drive here from Calgary? Her, <laughs> I. Uh, She's just such a powerhouse. I love riding her. It's honestly the best thing I've ever done. Yeah, like I, know, I know we're only on day two, but do you think you'll come here again? Oh, God, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's like the, uh, it's just such a welcome area. Everyone's so friendly. The classes are so fun. There's, like, I've never done a gambler's choice before, and getting to experience that, even though I wasn't riding in it, it was honestly so fun. Do you mind explaining what a gambler's choice is? So gambler's choice is when you have uh, a series of jumps and each jump is worth a certain amount of points. Um, and uh, you try to basically jump as many jumps as you can, earn as many points as you can within 60 seconds. It's been, it's just such a cool experience to be here. So it's Mark Humphreys. Well, obviously we've been going for well over 100 years now as an organization. So this will be the 54th Royal Manitoba Winter Fair. Um, obviously the Winter Fair itself started in 1906, so long traditions have been made here. And I know it fills up Keystone Centre, but what's greater impacts in Brandon area? Well, last time we did a, a study for ourselves, I think it was about an $18 million local economic uh, bang for the book. So if you think about how many hotels that fills, restaurants, shopping malls, uh, we do a lot for the local community as well as. I know you're probably on site most of the week. But what's it like if you go to a hotel or restaurant right now? Oh, it's busy. <laughs> busy in town. Make sure you book ahead. Uh, the hotel rooms, we're told, are full up. Um, obviously, it's still the odd place here and there, but uh, mostly full. And, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a good weather good weather week. So the, the attendance is already up uh, today and yesterday. So we're looking for a great end of week. When attendance goes up, how does that help Brandon? Well, of course, obviously, all that spins off. The gas stations are full. People are using the local suppliers and grocery stores and, of course, patronising our sponsors. So the sponsors that uh, look after us all year round uh, make these events possible. Um, all those are getting that economic spin-off from this event. Do you find, for a lot of the kids in town, is this maybe their first job? Oh, yeah, we've got, uh, I think we're employing about 23, 24 local school kids at the minute, just uh, just in helping set up and get down and get in, and uh, yeah, so even just just us here, you know, that's without the Keystone Centre. What kind of audience do you get here? Are they all from Brandon, or is it maybe a bit more international? Uh, no, we get them from uh, overseas, uh, we get them from over the border, from coast to coast to coast. And do you know, how many people roughly are employed for the week? Uh, for the week, well, employed, we only have uh, nine staff on for the Provincial X, over 150 volunteers, 39 board members, and then, of course, the Keystone staff and the part-timers. So a fair army, really, yeah. And I'm sure you 
I've heard that saying, Brandon is an event city. We're really built about different things coming each month. How has Winter Fair kind of contributed to that tourism idea that events are what make us? Well, of course, if you if you look at this one event, how many, again, spin-offs this has made for this society. We have Summer Fair to follow, Agex. Ag Days is a, a friend of ours and partner. Um, and then if you look, we've got the home show following shortly. So obviously one good key quality event starts to grow others and that's, that's the nature of the beast, um, which is fantastic to see. Economic development at its very best. How has recovery been post-COVID? You were one of the first that like, cancelled, one of the first back. Yeah, last, after, last year was, a, was an uphill battle, uh, but again, we were enticing trade show back, people through the door. This year has been a lot easier. People are ready to come back, go out and enjoy the fair. Tell me about the trade show. Trade show is full to the brim. There's not one space left. Uh, we've had to cram people into little corners, so it's full. It's busy and full. Every piece of retail therapy that you can imagine is here. You find, is it a lot of local companies or a bit of everything? And again, all over. Uh, lots of locals, but uh, we've had people driving in from Vancouver just over the week, uh, Toronto, uh, so yeah, all over the place. What's your favorite part of the fair? I think the favorite part is to see people come in and go out with smiling faces. So, uh, you know, you can see people anticipating a really good day. Uh, going home a little bit tired with a, with a brood of kids or grandma and granddad, but uh, usually always smiling in and out. That was Mark Humphreys, the Royal Manitoba Winter Fairs General Manager, speaking with the CBC's Chelsea Kemp. You also heard from Alex Armstrong, who drove from Calgary to compete in the horse show. The fair is on in Brandon until March 30th. It's 21 minutes after 12 o'clock. You're listening to CBC Radio 1, 89.3 FM, 990 AM. I'm Laura Hoogstratton. Mount Sema in the Yukon Territory recently hosted some special guests, veterans from across Canada and their partners, all part of the Shoulder to Shoulder Adaptive Ski Program. The organization provides resources for soldiers and other service providers. A group of 10 that included veterans, first responders and caregivers took part this year. Asud Chisti dropped by Mount Sema to learn more. Hang tight, we're working on it. So my name is Megan. So this is a really special event that we have at the moment. We have some veterans from all around the country participating in this event to bring uh, veterans that have served in service as well as first responders to come and participate in uh, a retreat style um, event where they can ski, snowboard, uh, snow go and just take some time out. My name is Alex. Essentially what adaptive sports is, is anyone with a form of any type of disability that just prevents them from using standard downhill equipment. I just uh, wanted to thank the people the shoulder to shoulder. I don't think any of us knew exactly that this type of program was out there. I just want to say you guys are doing a great thing uh, for all the vets out there and uh, for all the staff that you guys go to. You guys really make an impact on our lives as well. So thank you for that. My name is uh, Jens Sheen, and I'm, uh, rid- I'm from, originally from Newfoundland, but I live now in Victoria, B.C., and uh, I'm an Army veteran. I spent 21 years in the service. It's been truly, truly amazing. I feel so grateful to have this opportunity because um, after I got out of the military, I, like most of us, we have PTSD from what we've seen and what we did. And I, I kind of barred myself in the house and I didn't want to be a part of society. And I got up to almost 400 pounds and uh, I didn't feel good about myself as a soldier and as a person. And uh, I, I went through some real tough times with that. And I realized that I was a, uh, I wasn't a soldier anymore, but I had, and I realized I was a veteran healing. Uh, this place helped change, like this right now is, is giving me a new hobby because I, 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 you know, most times I bar myself in the house and I don't know how, you know, to get out and like everything that I used to like, I'm not sure about it anymore, right? Because of the military and all the stuff that, 
but now like I'm finding new hobbies like this and uh, I, you know it's my first time learning how to ski and uh, I learned how to ski and then I got on this snow bike it's called and it is so much fun and it makes you feel like I'm 50 years old and this makes me feel like I'm alive again and, I'm, and I mean, most military guys we like adrenaline rush right and this is it right and I feel so grateful that I was given this opportunity because it gets me out there with other veterans, other people. And you know, I've learned a few lessons even by being here, you know? And uh, yeah, it's, it's been truly, truly amazing. And I decided that I want to get out there and live a good quality of life, you know? I would never have had this chance, you know, without these people, right? Without this program. Wow, that was pretty inspiring to hear. That was Yant Shear, an armed services veteran. And thanks to Sud Chishi for bringing us that piece. And just coming up to 25 minutes after 12 o'clock, which means there's time for a song. Off their 2019 album, Carrying On, this is Casey and Clayton with The South Saskatchewan River. Quiver on Aspen near the river, South Saskatchewan. The snow goose turns to say, We're a long, long way from Galveston. Factory steam it billows to mile high poison pillows. We wander through the willows down. Then you turn to say We're a long, long way to Hudson Bay Where the sage and sharp-tailed grouses Used to look for spouses There's a row of new main houses Going up for sale Says a magpie to a mule deer I suppose they'll build a school here pretty soon We crest the river ridges See the city witches Made of tress of bridges and traffic lights of glow. It's then you turn to say, We're a long, long way from yesterday. That was Casey and Clayton with the South Saskatchewan River. You're listening to Radio Noon. It's just coming up to 29 minutes after 12 o'clock. Coming up after the 12.30 news, the Winnipeg Humane Society hopes to snare some attention with their Trade In Your Trap campaign. It's aimed at saving animals' lives. That's coming up right after the news. Of course, before that, we'll be talking with weather specialist Riley Lechuk, 
who comes bearing tidings of great joy, from what I understand, because apparently it's the end of the below zero forever uh, kind of spring that we've been having, and things are going to change. At least I'm counting on that. I hope I'm not stealing all of Riley's thunder by saying today is the last day of minus six, and tomorrow it goes up to one degree, and I'm looking ahead at the weather forecast, and Riley hates to be held to like too far in the future, but what it actually says in his forecast is Wednesday, nine, nine degrees. We've got that to look forward to because it is spring after all. It's March 27th. Come on. The Easter Bunny is, like, still wearing his Angora sweater and his little mitts over those little claws as he gets his Easter basket ready. But good news for him, 3 and 5 on Easter weekend. The news is next. This is CBC News. At 12.30, we're at minus 9 degrees with mostly sunny skies over downtown Winnipeg. Hello there, I'm Matt Humphrey. Community leaders in Winnipeg say the province should allow them to be in charge of neighborhood development. They want a significant increase in funding for indigenous centers, women's centers, and neighborhood groups. Don Olivense heads the Winnipeg Indigenous Executive Circle. It supports the urban indigenous population. Olivense says they have the experience and expertise to provide culturally appropriate responses. Despite our organization's commendable efforts with limited resources, there remains a glaring gap in government support for community-led development. Without a comprehensive strategy and dedicated funding, our ability to address complex challenges is severely compromised to the detriment of our community. The group wants the province to be an investor while the communities make the decisions. It's being called a jobs apocalypse. A British think tank says artificial intelligence is on path to eliminate as many as 8 million jobs across the United Kingdom. Anna Cunningham has your story. The Institute for Public Policy Research says artificial intelligence is advancing at such a pace that these heavy job losses could happen within a few years unless the jobs market adapts fast. This is a bit of a shock because people you know, have invested uh, in their skills. Carsten Young is a senior economist at the IPPR. They analysed 22,000 jobs and found some 11% currently at risk, but say that could soon jump to 59%. Top of the list is women, young employees, lower wage earners, entry-level jobs and even customer services. Young says it's not all doom and gloom. This is an opportunity, he says, for people to move to higher level jobs or into such sectors like social care that need the extra workforce. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. And work is happening to upgrade capacity of fuel terminals in Winnipeg. It's meant to increase how much fuel can be moved by trucks to gas stations. The province says upgrades to that offloading capacity are already complete in Gretna, near the U.S. border. The update comes less than two weeks after Imperial Oil said it had shut down a line which runs between Gretna and Winnipeg. Inspections had, inspections had raised concerns about a section of the pipe under the Red, under the Red River, just south of St. Adolph. In the line, which carries gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel, we're seeing an out-of-service disruption for approximately three months. Last week, some Winnipeg gas stations said they were running out of fuel. And that's your CBC News from Winnipeg. Thank you very much, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How about you? Enjoying the chilly... Uh, Spring. Well, I'm here to tell you. I I don't know if you were listening, but just before, um, I was saying that uh, weather specialist Riley Leachuk will be bringing us tidings of great joy. He's the man for it. He is the man for it. Uh huh. So Riley and I had just a little word or two as you were reading the news. So <clears throat> you better sit down, Matt, if you're uh, looking forward to this. Okay. 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 Well, Riley, are you bringing us tidings, tidings of great of, joy? Tidings of great joy, Lori, if you don't mind, five to ten centimeters of snow. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What? Wow. Is that? wow. Uh, Alberta Clipper. Uh, let, let's get right into it. Let's. Because uh, there, there is a lot to talk about. So uh, I'm going to step back and talk about that snow and that wind. Uh, Lori, you said your drive-in was a bit slick. It was a bit. 
Yeah, um, that that little skiff of snow that we got through yesterday has kind of helped with the wind polish up those those highways, mm-hmm. especially in open areas. So, uh, looking at snowfall totals around the city, uh, trace to uh, so about trace in the southwestern corner of Winnipeg, so the White Ridge area, for example, to about three centimeters uh, in the downtown area. Yes, coupled with those winds gusting up to sixty through last night, really did uh, create some issues with blowing snow and, of course, uh, some icy conditions. So. Uh, the snow really uh, centered around the Red River Valley. So Portage La Prairie, for example, just getting 0.3 centimeters. Argyle getting 0.5 centimeters. But yeah, just just enough to kind of slicken things up a little bit uh, through the overnight hours uh, into this morning. We should start to see a little bit of melting little bit as we get through the next few days here at least ahead of uh, more snow. Uh, minus 9 right now in Winnipeg and Brandon. Portage the Prairie is at minus 8 degrees and we've got minus 10s across much of northern Manitoba. Uh, minus 11 though in Flin Flon, uh, the Paw and Lynn Lake. So looking at uh, what we have in the days ahead here. So we're looking at mainly sunny skies really across uh, much of southern Manitoba this afternoon. That cloud from that Colorado low finally starts to depart, but bringing with it a little bit more snow to the Island Lake region uh, through Shimadawa, Gillum, uh, through the afternoon and evening hours today. Mainly sunny skies across the province tomorrow, a little bit of cloud uh, in the north still, uh, but then things change ahead of that with uh, cloud (laughs) building in for Friday morning. uh, And we start to see uh, the effects of that Alberta clipper kind of start to push in early in the morning on Friday in Westman. Uh, So by about lunchtime, Brandon, Verdon, up through Russell Roblin into the snow already, uh, and then starting to move into the Red River Valley by the time we get into the supper hour or so. So uh, looking at uh, forecast snowfall. Uh, some of the model runs, uh, at least that we're looking at in terms of our uh, our in-house models here at CBC, uh, showing about 15 centimeters for Winnipeg, 15 for Brandon, 20s for like Killarney, the Morden, uh, Winkler and Emerson regions. I think that's a little bit on the high side. I think we're looking at about 5 to 10 for the Red River Valley, maybe a little bit more back to the west into the southwest corner of the province. So we'll keep an eye on that as that kind of shifts as we get into the next couple of days here. Yes, another breezy day ahead here in the Red River Valley. So in comparison, Brandon looking at uh, northwest winds at about 10 gusting 20, maybe even 30 through the afternoon. Portisville Prairie, Gimli, Winnipeg, looking at northwest winds, 20, 30, gusting 40 or 50 through the afternoon today. So a lot windier on the on the eastern side of the province as we start to see that low finally departing. The effect's not really felt back to the west. Tomorrow, though, we're looking at a much uh, calmer day, at least uh, here in southern Manitoba. So uh, mainly sunny, minus 6 in Winnipeg, Gimli minus 4 this afternoon, minus 3 in Dauphin under the sunshine, Brandon, Verdon, both looking at sunny, minus 5s today. And a little bit of snow still uh, moving across northern Manitoba, uh, Gillum. Barron's River looking at some light snow, uh, Shimadawa as well. And uh, plus one is what I have for tomorrow under a sunny sky. Good Friday, we see that snow beginning in the afternoon, three degrees, Lori, and we're looking at twos and threes for the rest of the weekend and uh, Monday, a sunny five. Uh Uh-huh. I'll give you a taste. Late next week, uh, mid next week, we're looking at highs around nine, 10 degrees. You say so, that now. I say that now. <laughs> I, I just, just trying to, you know, offset the snow yeah. in well, the forecast. I, I love how bit. sort of brisk and cheerful you are about it all, <laughs> yeah. and you know, enthusiastic. But uh, no, thanks for thanks yeah. for the don't, uh, don't put your shovel away yet, Lori. Uh, my shovel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't have a shovel, right? <laughs> but my uh, husband does. Okay. Well, yeah. tell him not to put it away yet. Okay. <laughs> thanks a lot, Ronnie. You're welcome. That's Riley Lechuk, and you can hear him this afternoon on Up to Speed and later on tonight on CBC Television News. Well, let's move on. It is 22 minutes before 1 o'clock. Well, the Winnipeg Humane Society is launching their Trade in Your Trap campaign. The goal is to get people to turn in lethal animal traps to save both wildlife and pets from agony, injury, and death. Just within the past couple of months, a dog and a cat have been brought to the Humane Society with serious injuries after being caught in traps. So the Winnipeg Humane Society is anxious to get the public involved, and there are even prizes for turning in traps. Brittany Semanyuk is an animal welfare specialist with the Winnipeg Humane Society. Hi, Brittany. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. So tell me, how does the Trade in Your Trap program work? 
Right. So as you mentioned, this program really manifested because of two incidents that we saw in recent months where animals were coming in with with quite serious injuries because of traps. So we've launched the Trade in Your Trap program to encourage people that may have old uh, leg hold traps, snares, things like that, maybe sitting in their garage that they're not using anymore. A lot of these traps are illegal to use within city limits anyway. They don't really know how to dispose of them, what to do with them. So we're encouraging people to bring their traps to the shelter. um, And by doing so, they will be entered to win um, up to $200 towards anything in the pet shop of the organization. So there's a bit of a, a... cash prize at the end, but we really just want to encourage people to to bring their traps in because, um, as I mentioned, a lot of these traps can no longer be used within city limits. Right. And and the trade-in part is trade-in for a chance to win. Yeah, trade-in for a chance to win. So you're hopefully not going home empty, empty-handed. You yeah. can potentially win a lot of cool stuff from our pet store. Can you describe the traps a bit more, the kind of thing we're talking about for people who have no familiarity with them, like me? Yeah. So there are different types of traps. There are snares, which are the generally wire um, snares that people utilize to catch animals. There's the body gripping traps, also known as the conibear traps, um, which are another form of lethal trap. And then there, of course, are leg hold traps that trap the leg of the animal. And so what we have seen is that um, despite what these traps may have originally been set for, we know that traps do not discriminate and any animal is at risk of being caught in a trap. And, you know, there are a lot of research studies that come out that um, the numbers of non-targeted wildlife that do end up succumbing to traps uh, in North America is quite high. So it's not the most effective means when you're dealing with pest control. Um, There were amendments to the Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw back in 2022 that makes a lot of these traps illegal to use within city limits anyway. So if you are someone that's dealing with a pest issue, we really are encouraging people to reach out to professional pest control companies, seek out alternatives where live traps and rehoming may be possible in the specific instance, but don't just try to catch an animal yourself because we are seeing cats coming in with broken limbs. We're seeing... um, there are, there are just much better ways to deal with it than trying to take matters into your own hands. So I was going to ask you that. Why why do people even have these traps in the first place? What is it they're planning to catch? Um, again, it, it, it depends. There are instances of people trying to trap roaming cats. However, I do feel that the majority of people are using them to try and catch raccoons and squirrels and, you know, the urban pest wildlife that we sort of see. Um, some people may still be doing it illegally, even though they're not technically supposed to, although some may now just have these traps, you know, in their garage and they don't know what to do with them. So it is really a bit of a mixed bag within city limits. And you, you mentioned that a dog and a cat were recent victims brought to the Humane Society. Tell us what, uh, a bit more about them and, and um, what, what's happening with them now. Well, our most recent case was Winslow, a cat, and um, listeners might be aware of Winslow's story because Winslow was actually found dangling from a tree. Winslow's back leg was caught in a sort of leg hold trap, and we don't know the instance as to how that trap got into the tree. We don't know if it was intentionally set or not, but it was on private property within the city, and unfortunately, Winslow was a roaming cat who found his legs stuck in the trap and um, was in severe distress. Luckily, um, the call was made, and officers were able to pick up Winslow, and he had emergency surgery to, to have his leg amputated. But whether that's a cat or you know a squirrel or a raccoon, that is just not a humane way to deal with animals. And what about the dog? Um, well, we have had quite a few dogs come in throughout the years with trap injuries from throughout the province. So um, most recently, we actually had another cat come in named Enzo, who um, had a very, very severe injury to one of his legs that also needs amputation. Mm-hmm. Most of the times, they do need their limbs amputated, unfortunately. So you can just imagine the pain um, that both pets and wildlife mm-hmm. go through when they're caught in these sorts of devices. Um, A few years ago, listeners might recall the case of Ruby, who was a dog that was walking with her owner just outside the perimeter of the city of Winnipeg, and she was fatally killed because she was caught in a body-gripping conibear trap. Mm. So um, although this campaign really targets the city of Winnipeg, 
anywhere in the province of Manitoba where traps are being used. There needs to be a clear signage. There needs to be, you know, very obvious signage for, for pet owners and individuals walking so they know where their pets can or cannot be when taking them out in, in the countryside. And on a, on a positive note, I just want to mention that we have a video of Winslow the cat who, who's doing well. If you're watching our CBC YouTube channel, you, you can see Winslow. We have the Winnipeg Humane Society little, little video of, of Winslow uh, doing her thing. So I, I wanted to ask you, if traps are illegal in Winnipeg, won't that be a barrier to people trading them in? So we are not asking people to, you know, it's illegal to set a trap. It's not legal to own the trap. So we're not asking anyone about their personal information or why they have the traps. We're simply asking them to to see the Humane Society as a depot where they can bring their traps in. And, and hopefully the incentive is um, that they can, well, come to the shelter and potentially take home a new loving forever friend. That's incentive mm-hmm. number one. But incentive number two is coming down and, and winning a $200 gift card from the pet shop. So there's no repercussions from bringing in your traps to the organization. And I should stipulate that um, snap traps when dealing with mice and things like that, those don't technically qualify. We are looking at the, the larger yeah. uh, traps that deal with, with pests and, and those animals. And it starts today, is that right? Yeah, we just launched it today. It runs until uh, mid-April. So if anyone does have any questions, they're welcome to reach out. Otherwise, come down to the shelter for yourselves and, and, and talk to one of us. And you can learn more about the program or just bring your traps down. And, and like I said, we are full to the rafters with animals needing loving homes. So it's just another reason to come down to the shelter. Oh, it's good to hear that. And, and thank you very much for all the information, Brittany. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. That's Br- Brittany Semanyak. She's an animal welfare specialist at the Winnipeg Humane Society. And as she mentioned, you can start dropping off those traps today, whether they're yours or ones that you found in the bush somewhere. Drop them off at the Winnipeg uh, Humane Society at 45 Hearst Way. And uh, as I say, you can watch Winslow on the YouTube channel. For breaking news as it happens, stay with CBC News. For the latest updates and what it means for Canadians. Stay with CBC News. When the biggest stories break, both at home and around the world, stay with CBC News. Well, folk duo Two Crows for Comfort have new music out. This is their latest. It's called Hearts on Your Name. Stay out too late Streetlights flood the summer sky I'm in no hurry to get home Talk all night long Without even speaking to each other You could read my mind all alone Promise the world that we'd make it Hearts on your name, but we break it, we break it It was easier, easier than these days Ten years move fast I'm scared to see your face and there's so many things I wanted to say How's your family? Last week spoke and he was troubled. How's your brother keeping these days? Glad that you will and you made it. I see the same, but I'm faking, I'm faking. It was easier, easier than these days. These days, these days We could be close I wasn't myself and I did a little better than my best I have tendencies Drive people away and I haven't 
seem to figure it out yet Promise my world that I make it So falling down as I'm breaking, I'm breaking It was easier, easier than these days Loving hurts, it never works these days It was easier, easier than these days That was the latest from Two Crows for Comfort. That was Hearts on Your Name. You're listening to CBC Radio Noon. It's 10 to 1. And last year was the worst wildfire season on record in this country. And fires still smolder in many areas. But a government initiative aims to help the fight against wildfires with a better look from space. Tech columnist Manjela Salvaraja looks at the Wildfire Satellite Project. More than 6,500 wildfires, over 18 million hectares burned to date. That's the tally for 2023, according to the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre. Wildland fire protection now costs over $1 billion annually, according to Natural Resources Canada. But the federal government is investing in a new tool to fight this growing threat. It's a constellation of satellites the Canadian Space Agency plans to launch in 2029. The initiative is called Wildfire Sat, and it'll monitor wildfires in Canada daily. Morgan Crowley explains what satellites from NASA and other non-Canadian agencies provide now. So you get maybe an observation at 2 p.m. and then you get an observation maybe at 2 a.m., but you don't really have anything in between. Crowley is one of the scientific leads on the Wildfire SAD initiative. She's a forest fire research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service, a part of Natural Resources Canada. She says these existing satellites miss capturing the peak burn period. We have a missing part of our observations, and that's in the middle of the afternoon, the late afternoon, when the fires are at their hottest and most extreme. And so that's limiting when you're making, for fire managers, when they're making decisions at the end of the day for what they're going to be putting their resources to towards tomorrow. Wildfire Sat is actually um, going to have data delivery in the hands of the fire managers within 30 minutes of the overpass time. The project is a collaborative effort by Natural Resources Canada, the Canadian Space Agency, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. More data on this front does matter. According to the federal government, 3% of uncontrolled fires cause 97% of the burn. Crowley says the information from these satellites will allow provinces to target their response to the fires which need an immediate reaction. It's impossible to to do that for every single fire. So using satellite information like that can be extremely valuable. And it also kind of levels the playing field between maybe provinces that have fewer aircrafts and it gives them more tools to be able to monitor more fires if, if we have another unprecedented fire season, essentially. These small satellites will have infrared sensors which measure the energy from the fires. So for the past over 10 years, they've been working on these advanced uh, infrared sensors, the microbolometers. And this is really a Canadian technology that prior to this, um, small satellites for fire monitoring weren't really possible because they needed basically a satellite with a, a bus size cooling system to be able to have an infrared sensor. So being able to have micro satellites, small satellites that use microbolometers that are really the size of an LED light bulb, that means that they can launch a suite of them to have more observations. And also it's a lower cost on everyone involved. The initiative aims to help people managing the response on the ground decipher the intensity of these fires and the rate at which they spread. Miriam Mikkel is the Deputy Project Manager on the Wildfire Sat mission at the Canadian Space Agency. In terms of having to send firefighters out to really see as to where the spread is, this satellite imagery will be able to give you that information and not have to put those lives in danger. 
And then on top of that, of course, help for emergency preparedness services. And if there is evacuations that need to happen and how we can better predict that versus having to put somebody in the line of fire to, to go see and really assess the, the level of its intensity and its growth. And the predictions for wildfire seasons in the years ahead don't look good. According to projections from the federal government, by 2050, the amount of forest burned by wildfire will double, brought on by climate change. If this pattern of long and intense wildfire seasons persists, as climate predictions show, it'll be rough going for the communities in the path and the firefighters sent to protect them. For CBC Radio, I'm Manjula Salvaraja. That was Dana Lee with Magic, and that was a magical-sounding little tune. Now joined in the studio by Chloe Friesen, the possibly magical oh, host. I sure uh, hope so. That'd be up fun. Up to speed. <laughs> Do a trick. No. Oh, I wish. No. Uh, Lori, uh, I want to ask you, how does your family celebrate Easter? Is there anything that you eat in particular yearly? Uh, yes, mostly everything we can get our hands on. Amazing. My Great answer. granny always made what was called daffodil cake. And it's like a well, it's like angel food cake. Only I think you there's some point where with the batter you sort of swirl in a sort of egg yolky thing, so that when you bake it, it's kind of all swirly. Oh, gorgeous! And then I think it just had like icing sugar on it. So daffodil. That cake. sounds delicious. Yeah. For me and my family, it's Pasca. It's a sweet Easter bread. All right, um, but. We're going to be asking people on Up to Speed about this. And actually, we'll speak with a local bakery owner who's busy preparing all sorts of sweets for the weekend. She's making uh, potizza, hot cross buns, pasca, all sorts of different cultural Easter treats. What's potizza? It's, it's um, potizza. Oh. It's a... Uh, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, goodness. I just I just talked to her. Well, listen to Up to Speed this afternoon, and you will find out exactly what it is. It's a Slovenian treat. Oh, of course it is. walnuts. What's wrong with me? 
I knew that. So yeah, we'll learn more about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs> You're welcome. That's Chloe Friesen, guest host on Up to Speed this afternoon from 3 to 6. Have a snack with you. I'm hungry already just talking about that. Thanks very much to Corey Funk, Matt Humphrey, Riley Lechuk, Brad Lilly, Daniel Friesen, and Dylan Longhurst. And we'll be back again tomorrow for Thursday, which is, of course, Good Friday Eve. Have a pleasant day. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.